Welcome uh, to week two of three. Uh, we're working through this theme of the, the hope for a wounded victor, and you can still pick up one of these down the back if you want to follow along at home. Um, if you missed last week, it might be some helpful stuff in there to help you come along. Um, but basically, we talked about sin and the broken nature of our world last week. Um, I don't know if you saw the news this week, but I just saw a breakdown of relationships again and again. There was the Beirut explosion, um, our own politicians fighting with each other and trying to tear each other down. Um, There was a mass brawl in Wellington on Saturday night. I don't know if you saw that. That's pretty harrowing. Um, And the coronavirus continues to be a problem across the world. I even see it in our neighborhood, around this place, and um, the most disturbing of all, I often see it in me. Those broken relationships we talked about are still kind of broken. Uh, That humanity and God, the humanity and each other, humanity within ourselves, and the humanity in the environment. I don't know if you ever have this thought or walked away from last week thinking, well, how is this going to end? Where are we going to go? How is this world ever going to come back from this? And for me, this is where the second part of our Genesis 3 story comes into play as what we read today. This part is the part where God is handing down the consequences of sin And I wonder what your image of God in that moment is. He's often described as a parent figure. And when he's handing down consequences, what what sort of image of God comes to mind in that space? What do you think of? When we are at home, we talk a lot about natural consequences. Things that normally happen when you do something wrong. So for instance, um, if I went out and crashed a car that wasn't mine, I would have to pay the excess of that person's car. That that would be a natural consequence for me crashing their car. Or one that that maybe, I don't know if that strikes with you, but uh, when you cook a meal and you leave your plate lying around in your room um, for days, um, you have to scrub that thing till it's clean. That's a natural consequence of leaving that plate in your room. And this is where I see God working in this space. There's some natural consequences that he said would happen if, these, if they chose to listen to their own voice and the voices around them rather than trusting God had the right thing in mind for them. And the reality of their choice is that now access to God and access to the garden has been broken, left behind, disrupted. And so there are consequences for humankind and the snake. And so God starts handing down punishments. He says to the snake, you'll crawl on your belly all the days of your life, you'll eat dust. The snake uh, represents evil, the evil powers, the forces that act beyond us. And we talked last week about a bridge and its engineering um, being something that maybe the snake stands for. To the woman, he says, I'll make childbirth painful, or childbirth will be painful. Not that he'll make it painful, but it will be painful. There is a desire, too, for her male counterpart in there. So there there's, comes this, un, this broken relationship between them. And to the man, he says, no longer will food be easy. You can't just grab off all the trees of the garden, but instead you'll have to toil the earth. You'll have to find it hard to get food. To the ground, you will return. Death will happen. From where you came, you will return. Those wonderful words we say on Ash Wednesday. And perhaps you read this and you think about a wrathful God, a God that you find it hard to reconcile within yourselves, a God that maybe is um, punishing, hurting, and so that sits uncomfortably for me. But I think the key is hidden in the punishment. The key to God's character, who he stands for, and the mercy 
that he has over this place. God's giving down a punishment to the snake and hidden within there is verse 15. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring, and he will strike your head and you will strike his heel. That's a hope for the humans because one day a seed of this woman will destroy the evil force that is in play. One day, someone will come and crush the head of that snake. That's an image of destroying that evil power. One day, a seed of the woman, an offspring of the woman. But it's not that easy for that person either because it says the snake will strike the heel. It's almost as if the snake will get his own back. And in fact, if you look at the booklet, that's exactly what we've put on the front here, that image of striking the heel. And so hidden among the punishments, the handing down, the natural consequences, is this hopeful promise God gives. He says, one day, this will all be dealt with. This will all be finished. The nature of evil will disappear and there will be this offspring, this person who comes from the woman who will deal with all of this. Now we called this series A Hope for a Wounded Victor. That is the wounded victor right there. The sense of someone who will destroy evil but be hurt in the process. Now we live beyond the cross of Jesus We worship in a Christian church beyond the side of Jesus, and perhaps we can actually see who the wounded victor might be. But to people who are reading this, uh, the Torah, the Israelites, there was an expectation that one day this person would come. And so as they read, they think, is this the person? Is this the one? Is this the, you know, like they're hoping for this person to come. Is this the person? And so you read about Cain and Abel, and you think, wow, this is, this is literally the offspring of the woman. Is this gonna be the person? No, it's not gonna be the person. He kills his brother. <clears throat> Further on, you read about Noah, and he looks promising in the beginning. He builds this ark, he trusts God's word, he follows through, and then all of a sudden, he saves humanity through the waters. There's like a sense of like, this, this is someone who is, is doing, daring with the evil in the world and coming through it, but it's not him either because he messes up in the tent. And we meet Moses and he also comes through the water as if like a savior figure through the basket on the ark. And he comes through and he's, everything's going really well and then the wilderness happens and he can't reach the promised land. And so we realize that, oh, it's not him either. And then you meet David and a whole heap of other characters And David, he just basically spies something desirable on a rooftop and thinks he'll have it as his own. And so it continues. Israel is holding out and continue to hold out until the end of the Old Testament. Who is this person who is gonna come and deal with this problem that we have in this world? Those broken relationships. Who's gonna come and be the person who sings this? But again, the image of God is potentially wrong because they think it's gonna come by might and power and he'll be a great king and he'll be a massive, awesome person. No, he'll be the wounded victor hurt by the snake himself. <clears throat> In the last part of our reading from Genesis, um, we, it talks about how humanity gets cut off from the garden, a banishment, a kind of get out kind of idea. This is the second thing, I think, for me that has changed recently around who God is in this space. I've often read this and thought God is this angry, vengeful, punishing God. But I think this part, the second part, is where God is actually merciful and kind and generous to humanity. He says to the, to, he's sort of speaking to um, the other 
other people around him in, his, in God's household, and he says, humanity has now become like one of us. They know good and evil. And they must not be allowed to reach out their hand and take from the tree of life and eat and live forever. And it's almost like you see like God saying, well, that's it, you know, they've, they've cut it off, that's the end, that's gone. But someone recently reframed this for me. They recently showed this as a form of mercy. And when I read it again, I could see the mercy hidden within it. The consequence of sin was death. The consequence of, of, of that choice, of trusting God's way, he said that would lead to death. That would, that would be the end of it. So death has entered this world when they ate the tree in knowledge of good and evil. The tree of life, which is the other tree in the Garden of Eden, stands for eternal life, a symbol of them living in harmony and peaceful and shalom in that space. But if you're in a state of death and living eternally, I just think that's cruel. You're continually dying and dying to yourself and dying to others and causing all sorts of pain in that moment. So instead, God says, no, actually, it's not right for you to live there, not right to you live in that space. I'll be merciful and unfortunately send you out into the wilderness. But he gave that hope still. Someday I'll come and I'll sort this out. Someone from that woman will come and sort this out. And so we get to the New Testament and John opens his passage with this massive like thing of this is the word of God, this is who Jesus is. And Jesus comes to his baptism in the end of that and he says, John, the baptizer, pronounces, Jesus is the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus is the person they've been holding out for. The hope of the world is built on Jesus when he arrives in that moment. But they still don't really realize who, they, who he is because the image of God is still of someone who will come and slash and burn and cut down and destroy the Roman Empire and take it out. That's the image of God that they have. And so they don't get the picture that yes, he will triumph over evil, but remember the evil powers will strike back as well. And Jesus continually says again and again in the Gospels, I have to die, I have to be wounded in order to be victorious. But the image of God did not allow for this. And so when we look around the world and we think, man, this is, this is going badly, um, there's explosions, there's political posturing, there's mass brawls, there's gossiping, there's fighting within the churches, there's making idols out of money, maybe making idols out of ways we worship, maybe buildings are a really big idol. Or maybe you look around and think, man, this coronavirus is just not going well. What's our image of God in that space? What's the image we have for God to come and be the hope in that space? Jesus has come, yes, but Jesus has not completed what he came to do. The hope for us comes in the second coming of Jesus when every tear and pain and things will be wiped away. We have a very similar hope of this wounded victor that Israel have in that sense where our God will come and one day sort this out. I think the thing for us to figure out, the thing for us to work at is let's not get our image of God confused. Let's be reminded of who Jesus is in this place. And as we come uh, to communion today, that's a place that reminds us that Jesus is the wounded victor. He's the one who had to suffer, had to die in order to win. The evil would strike him because he would win overall. And this altar here, this communion service we participate in reminds us of the death of Christ, the fact that actually, although the week has been hard out there, although things have been tough, although you've been doing it hard, 
personally, maybe there's lots of things going on in your life, whatever it is, the hope is we come to this table and we remind ourselves that God is the wounded victor. He is victorious over evil. He is the one who will sort it out. And we remind ourselves again and again that this God is not a God of power and might, but a God of gentle humility and self-emptying. He's a God that gave all of himself in order to restore this world to him, in order to restore the relationships amongst us. That is the image of God we come and remind ourselves of. Lord God, you are the hope for this world. You are the one who will sort it out. You are the victor in this place. And so as we come today, remind us of who you are, what you stand for, and why we trust in you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.